What's up, everybody, and happy Labor Day on this fun-filled, college football-packed three-day weekend. I hope those of you that get a three-day weekend that are enjoying your day off today spend a little bit of that time off with me, either watching or listening to this episode. Man, we have got a jam-packed show. Week one was insane. Week one was insane at the national level. It was also insane at the American Athletic Conference level, and that's what I'm going to bring to you on this show is all the action of the American Athletic Conference. Uh, We know at the national level, Colorado and TCU stole the show. Then we had Florida State putting the nation on notice last night against LSU. But we also got some intriguing storylines happening in the American Conference. So without further ado, man, I'm going to get into it. All I ask you to do real quick, if you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe, Leave a comment at the end, share it with a friend. If you're listening on the streaming platform, and particularly Apple, uh, please give it a five-star rating and leave a review. Thank you so much for those of you who have left reviews. basically since the end of last week and over the weekend, man, those, those really do make my day. But in the grand scheme of things, as I've been saying, really trying to push it up in the algorithm and get it ranked. A um, lot of exciting things happening with this show and with the coverage of this conference. So, and, and welcome everybody who's been listening from other conferences. I've actually gotten some people reach out to me either on social media or by email who, who say they're a fan of another conference, but they like to keep tabs on the American and they kind of stumbled across my show either on YouTube or on um, one of the streaming platforms. And so welcome to y'all as well. Uh, So here's how this is going to go down. Okay. I'm going to do a week one rundown and I'm going to basically give you a quick one minute take of each team that played. Now, why one minute? Well, because it's non-conference play and that's 13 games. I'm not doing Navy Notre Dame because I talked about that last week, but the other 13 teams played, you know, that's half the episode right there. Um, and, And then as we get deeper into the season and conference play starts and we've got less games, um, I can maybe speak a little more in depth to each one. My plan is if I can stay on schedule is to go through the rundown, give you the latest realignment update, some thoughts there. And then I do have a mailbag question. Um, if I'm going to have time, if I don't have time today, um, I'll get to it this week. It was, uh, from Twitter X from at the, I believe guy, temple owl fan. All right, well, let's start with Thursday night. We had Tulsa and UAB on deck. We'll start with Tulsa. Tulsa, one-minute rundown. They were very sloppy and undisciplined to start the game. It was, a, it was a tough first quarter for them. Then their quarterback goes down. Braylon Braxton, who I've been very high on this offseason, goes down with an ankle injury. UAPB is up 7-0 at the end of the quarter, and it's almost looking like, wait a minute. Is the Kevin Wilson era going to take a little bit longer than what I was expecting? Because I didn't expect to see this. Well, the backup quarterback comes in and just goes off. Cardell Williams, they put up 28 second quarter points, and you really saw the explosiveness of this offense. So I think that first quarter, if you just kind of ignored that and look at how they played the second, third, and fourth quarter, my goodness. Obviously, the caveat for most of these games I'm going to be discussing is what does this look like against tougher competition, right? It's week one. Most of these games were were against far inferior competition. But man, that Tulsa offense was explosive. I don't know what they're doing with the quarterback situation. I haven't heard what's going on with Braylon Braxton and his ankle. I don't know if Cardell Williams, the redshirt freshman, like won the job. I'm not sure. Uh, but I know they've got Washington coming up this weekend, and I, I'm excited for that now, especially after seeing what Washington did to Boise State. Boise State is like the premier team of the Mountain West Conference, and the Mountain West Conference being uh, the biggest threat of competition for that New Year's Six bid at the G5 level. So I'm curious to see how a team that most have picked to be a, kind of a middle-of-the-road, middle-of-the-pack AAC team, Tulsa, does against Washington, and then compare that to how the premier team of the Mountain West did against Washington. So that's Tulsa. UAB, as I put on my Twitter account, man, I love this offense. Very methodical, very efficient, a lot of a lot of formations, a lot of shifting and pre-snap motions. Uh, I think Alex Mortensen had an excellent game plan. What I'm looking forward to seeing as the season progresses is do they look to push the ball downfield even more? 
of course, they, they, they had a couple deep shots that they connected on. So I'm not saying they didn't do it at all. I'm just curious to see if they open it up even more as the season goes on or if this is the identity. We're going to run the ball. We're going to hit you on these quick screens and this quick game passing. And then we're going to use that to very uh, strategically set up when we take our shots. Uh, I thought that was the, – the, and the defense as well. Defense was solid. Um uh, their competition gets a little bit better this upcoming week when they play Georgia Southern, but we're really not going to know what to expect from UAB, I think, until conference play because then it's like they're going from one end of the extreme to the other. They're playing these first two, and then all of a sudden they've got um, uh, Georgia, I think, if that's the following week, which is, you know, Georgia is Georgia. But no, I mean, it's, it's going to be more competition. You know, Georgia Southern, and uh, curious to see how they look. Um, and what that offense looks like, I mean, their quarterback was incredibly efficient, incredibly accurate. I felt like him and Mortensen were in a very good rhythm. And uh, Trent Dilfer, man, hats off to him. His debut game as a Division One head coach, I mean, his team looked disciplined. His team looked prepared. And those are things you want to see out of a team in week one, especially a team being coached by a first-year guy with two first-year coordinators. If, if I didn't already know that, I would not have expected that watching the team play. Um, if that makes sense. And I'll tell you this right now about Trent Dilfer. There's going to come a game where he is going to absolutely verbally eviscerate an official. I don't know when it's going to happen. It's going to be a heated moment. Uh, that's going to be a blown call. And he is going to go off. You saw little flashes of it uh, last Thursday, but I'm ready to see. I I'm here for it too. So anyways, if you're a UAB fan, let me know your thoughts on your squad. Uh, now let's move on to the Saturday slate. ECU. Listen, ECU faced the brick wall, number two team in the country, Michigan Wolverines, a team coming off back-to-back -back playoff appearances, and they look primed and ready for another Big Ten championship run and a playoff appearance. And quite frankly, even though the score doesn't indicate it, they put up a fight. And if I'm ECU, listen, I'm flushing this and moving on. I am not going to let that define my season. I'm going to find the silver linings of it. What was the silver lining for ECU, in my opinion? The front seven. They held their own for the most part of that game against one of the best offensive lines in the country. One of the best run games in the country. Now, offensively, they got some work to do. But how much work do they have to do? I think we'll know better this week because, yeah, against the number two team in the country's defense, it was just flat but uh with Marshall coming up this weekend I think we're going to get a better look at uh how well-rounded this ECU Pirate team is I've told you this is a team that's been knocking at the door uh for the past few you know really last season as it kind of seemed like they got over that hump got to eight wins and now you know if Mason Garcia can get it together they did go a little two quarterback against Michigan. I don't know how much of that was by design, how much of that was just the flow of the game and how much of that was just Michigan's defense. Like, let's try anything. But I think we'll get a better look at the offense against Marshall. And man, if that front seven plays like that all season, uh, they're going to they're gonna cause some fits for some teams, especially when conference play starts. So looking forward to watching those guys. Uh, SMU, uh, obviously they got the big news for the ACC. We discussed that last week. They came out against Louisiana Tech, and boy, they looked the part. They looked ready. They looked prepared. Uh, I've been saying they're going to have one of the best rushing attacks in the conference. They showed that in the first half, uh, jumped out to a Man, I want to say it was like a, what was it at halftime? Let me look here. I mean, it was a pretty big halftime lead. Um, yeah, 31 to nothing is what it was. Yeah. But then the second half, they looked a little flat. In fact, they lost the second half. I think, uh, you know, the score ended up being 38-14, uh, but... Louisiana Tech won the second half 14-7. So I don't know how much of that was getting rotational players in. I don't know how much of that was pulling off the gas. It just seemed like for SMU, it was a tale of two halves. They came out that first half, and, man, they looked solid. They took some shots down the field. They hit them. They, their running game looked solid. Their defense looked solid. And then they came out the second half and looked a little flat. And so I think what I'll be watching for as the season plays out is can they put two complete halves of football together, uh, really starting this weekend when they got uh, OU on deck, uh, who just absolutely obliterated Arkansas State, put up a 70-burger on them. So 
Looked good overall, fit the bill for what I expected, but as I mentioned, they didn't really play a full four-quarter game of football. So we'll see how that looks as the season plays out. Uh, Temple, the Temple Owls. As you know, if you've been listening to this show, I've been pretty high on the Temple Owls and Tulsa having bounce back seasons. And quite frankly, the start of that game, I started regretting of uh, my, my advocacy for Temple, mainly because I was watching how Akron's front seven seemed to be bullying Temple's offensive line. And then even defensively, Temple uh, was struggling in that first half. And I don't know what adjustments Coach Drayton made, but Temple came out in the second half and looked like a completely different team. Maybe the first half was just that week one jitters that most teams deal with, but man, second half, the defense shut them out. The offense made a comeback and they ended up getting the win. And it wasn't as, it wasn't as convincing as I'm sure Temple fans would have liked, but it was a 24-21 victory. When you're coming off a three and nine season, man, a win is a win. You take them however you can get them, especially when they were down, uh, I think 21-10 at halftime. But like I said, they made some, they made some offensive adjustments and um, ended up shutting them out in that second half. So that was Temple, and Temple's got Rutgers coming up. Rutgers looked pretty dang good against Northwestern. Now, we know Northwestern's probably going to be a dumpster fire this year, given all the stuff that happened you know, in early August, late July, early August, or whatever. So curious to see what that matchup looks like this weekend. Uh, and then we had Rice uh, in the Fox slot at 3 o'clock, 2.30, 3 o'clock time slot playing Texas. Quite frankly, I was impressed with Rice's defense. Uh, particularly in the first half. I mean, they really seemed to be given Texas fits. Texas's drives kept stalling out. Um, and then it seemed like the bottom fell out in the third quarter. I think that was when Texas put up maybe 21 points is what it was. Um, yeah, they put up 21 third quarter points. Um, and that ended up being the decider of the game. Rice's offense really struggled against that Texas defense. So I'm curious to see how much of that is, is Rice's offense and how much of that was Texas's defense because Rice actually has Houston coming up. And, I mean, to be frank, Houston's defense looked pretty dang good against UTSA this last weekend. Um, obviously, Frank Harris struggled. That was a part of it, but you still got to tip your hat to that Houston defense. So that's who Rice has coming up. Like I said, if that, that first half defense is, is who they are, and that wasn't just Texas's offense struggling. I mean, that could be a pretty salty unit um, this season in the American Conference. Uh, moving on, we have USF, the Bulls. Um, they lost to Western Kentucky. They were a 11 and a half point underdog. I felt like USF could win that game. Now, I, I know I was really high on them, and even some USF fans right here on the YouTube channel left, some, left a couple comments saying, hey, I don't think they're ready for that just yet. Uh, Golish still has to work out the run game, I think one commenter said. And, and just some, some good feedback. But here's the reality. USF was in position to win that game. Uh, WKU just kind of ran away with it there at the end um, um, in, the, in the fourth quarter. You know, it was a one-possession game. Most of the game, South Florida was leading or it was tied um, one of the, the storylines from that game is that Gary Bohannon did not play. It sounds like he's still dealing with a shoulder injury. But Bryce Burrow, you guys tell me if you watched that game, like, did he not win the job? Especially when you think about Golish, who's in his first year, new program. Like, do you just ride with the young guy for the rest of the season or do you go back to the guy who's on his final year? I, I don't know. You know, that's up for debate. But uh, Bryce Burham, if I'm saying that correctly, uh, I know I always mess that one up, but he, um, he looked good. So, in fact, I'm wanting to look at it right now because I want to make sure I'm saying it right for those of you. Oh, I'm so dumb. Bryce Byram Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, USF fans. I'm not even going to edit that out. I'm going to just let it ride. Byron Brown, uh, who I believe is a red shirt freshman. Um, Y'all are probably thinking, dude, you need to do your study on Byron Brown. You're right. I watched him play and he won me over. But uh, I'm looking him up right now. So, yep, yep, yep. 
redshirt freshman. And uh, that's the thing. That's kind of one of the things as a coach. First year, you know, he looked well. He looked good. Do you just ride with him, let him play through his mistakes, um, and let this team continue to improve and rally around him? Or do you go back to your senior when he's healthy? Um, I feel like this. This is the last thing I'll say on USF. I think the, 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 the USF team we see in mid-October will not be the team we just saw this week. And I, I think Golish uh, may even be, in some people's minds, ahead of schedule in terms of uh, really turning this thing around. I mean, keep in mind, this has been a football program that has been bad for several years now. I mean, bad. And uh, they had some fight. They had some explosiveness, and I think we're going to see some significant improvement out of them as the season plays out. All right, keeping it moving. UNT, guys. <sighs> that, this, they were my disappointment of the weekend. Um, man, they couldn't tackle. They couldn't stop the run. Uh, it really felt like Cal just came in and absolutely bullied them. Now, there were some bright lights. There were some, there were some high points. They, they, they had moments where they were explosive on the offensive end. They were hanging in there for a while. I mean, it was 27-21, I think. They were trading scores. Um, and then the, the game just got away. The offense stalled. They brought in another quarterback. The Cal run game just was way too much. The Cal defense seemed to have adjusted, and it ended up making for a, a pretty pretty embarrassing blowout. I think Cal ended up winning like 58-21. And I was, you know, really high on North Texas coming into this game. I thought there was a lot of excitement. I thought they were a lot further along than what they were. Even though at AAC Media Days, I, I remember like looking at the guys they brought who were linemen that were like, you know, comparable to some of the skill guy positions for other teams. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. But you never want to, like, use that to, to dictate, you know, results on field. But I did. I thought they were a lot further along. Even Coach Moore said that. He's like, man, I, <laughs> we're not where I thought we were, was, his, was the bottom line of what he said. Now, here's where this could be a positive, is I initially thought North Texas would go in, compete, win the game, and even if they didn't win, it would be so competitive that it would raise and elevate the expectations of the fan base that when they hit the wall somewhere in the season, like I projected they would, um, and then they ended up, you know, maybe finishing six and six and getting a bowl game, fans would be disappointed by that because of the, the way the season started so high on such a high note. Well, it might actually end up being the opposite. It might be they're just going to hit the wall right now. Coach Morris is going to have to power through it, make the adjustments he needs to make. They're going to find their rhythm. And I still think this is a team that can be bowl eligible. But now, instead of the fan reaction being disappointment because of how the season started, the fan reaction will be like, whoa, there will still be a lot of excitement because of how the season started. So um, if anything, that's how I'm spinning it for the old North Texas mean green. And uh, they got FIU this weekend. So followed by Louisiana Tech and Abilene Christian before their first conference game. So let's see if they can put something together, rattle off some wins. And uh, again, and no disrespect to Cal. I just, I don't, I, again, I don't know if Cal's that good or if North Texas was that bad. So time will tell. Speaking of Cal, though, I mean, what a, what a weekend for the pack. <laughs> they go undefeated as they're getting ready to be, you know, disbanded pretty much. Okay, okay, keep it moving, Trey. Keep it moving. All right, we got Charlotte. Listen, I really loved what I saw out of the fighting Biff Pogies, especially on the defensive side of the ball. Um, man, they were relentless. They, they had a lot of grit. They had a lot of tenacity. South Carolina State moved the ball now. I'm not saying they didn't. But when it came time to anchor down and hold the line, that Charlotte defense got it done. Uh, there was just a there, – there was a fight that was there, and – uh, I think it was a good good game for them to start off on a high. Uh, they had a sellout crowd. I think they ended up winning 24 to three, something like that. Um, offensively, though, they're gonna have to work out those kinks. Um, their offense just was not clicking from my vantage point. Now, granted, I was also watching five other games throughout the course of that Charlotte game, but I did have it on one of my screens. And it seemed like every time I was watching, they'd start to get something going and then it'd go flat. And, you know, they finally pushed through. They had a big second quarter um, and then they got another score there at the end. But 
it seemed like there was a lot of meat left on the bone offensively, which it's week one, though. They've got, you know, a whole season to continue to improve and get better. So we'll see what this offense looks like um, this weekend, man. It's a big one. It's Maryland. I mean, this is where Biff Pogey, this is, this is where he made a name for himself. This is his old stomping grounds, uh, St. Francis Academy. He had the HBO show as their head coach there. He's kind of a legend up there in the DMV area. Most of his players that he brought in through the portal over the offseason at some point are either, were either from that area or played for him at St. Francis Academy. This is a big game for Pogey. This is a big game for much of the players on his team. And I'm curious to see what they look like against Power 5 competition. Um, and uh, not saying they're going to go in and get an upset, but I'm telling you, I think we're going to see a team playing incredibly hard. And uh, yes, the competition is going to be a lot different than what it just was, but, and maybe that was the thing. Maybe offensively they, by design, kept things very vanilla because they didn't want to show too much knowing how big of a game this would be uh, week two against Maryland. So that's, that's a thought to consider as well, but man, Love the atmosphere they had at that game. It's not the biggest stadium, but they sold it out. Um, and man, it just what, what Pogey has done, man, is he's generated a lot of excitement around that program in the Charlotte area. And it was good to see them come out and start the season off with a convincing win. Um, all right, FAU. Hey, I've been saying for FAU, man, it's comeback season. It's comeback season. I've been saying it all off season that this team reminds me of the squad that Coach Herman took over at Houston. I mean, almost, almost identical, it feels like. I mean, they've got the athletes out on the edge. They've got the quarterback, um, the dual threat guy at quarterback. The defense is solid. And, you know, I'm not just going to sit here and say, oh, he'll, he's going to do this year at FAU what he did his first year at Houston. But my goodness, I'm not, I don't think it's out of reach. And granted, the competition's going to get tougher, right? They played Monmouth, who gave up, you know, 45-plus points five games last year. Uh, but, man, Casey Thompson, it's his revenge tour. You know, he had the situation at Texas when he got benched, and then he goes to Nebraska and actually started the season off well, and then he got hurt. I mean, he's on a revenge tour. This is his season to be redeemed. This is his redemption season. And uh, he got off to a hot start with – five touchdown passes. And, and what was great about some of those though, too, is he didn't have to do all the work. I mean, you look at some of the plays that his receivers and running backs made. This is an offense that's going to put up points this year. And uh, they can, they're, they're a threat in the run game and in the pass game. And I think defensively, you're going to continue to see this squad get better. They got a lot of speed. They got a lot of athleticism. And um, hey, I mean, this is, this is a team that could do it, guys. And I'm already seeing I'm going to go over time-wise, so just hang with me. All right, Memphis. Memphis looked the part. As I've been saying, they've got all the ingredients to put together a conference championship winning season. Uh, Seth Hennigan, I think he had that one mishap where we're through the pick six. But other than that, he looked sharp. Uh, offensively, they looked sharp. Defensively, they looked sharp. And... Uh, all that's left to see is how are they going to look when the competition gets better, even though they've got the talent to handle better competition. I think the question mark that's been on Memphis these past few seasons is can they sustain this for a full 12 games? Like, can they sustain this over the course of a full season? I think that's what's got question marks around Ryan Silverfield, even though he looked like he had his team well prepared. They executed well. From what I watched, man, they were disciplined. They were efficient. Question is, will they sustain it over the course of the season? Because if they can, I'm telling you, watch out. This is a team that can make a pretty incredible run. Uh, moving on, we got UTSA. All right, here's my advice to UTSA. Do not let Houston beat you twice. Don't let Houston beat you twice, period. What do I mean when I say that? It's a huge hyped game. It was a revenge game. It was the first game in the American Athletic Conference, and it's now considered a game against a Power 5 opponent. There was so much anticipation, so much energy, so much excitement surrounding this opening season debut, and then you go out and you lose. Frank Harris threw three interceptions. You still had a chance to win, but there was a blown call at the end on the spot of the ball, and it's like that had – that that – is a formula for having a hangover coming out the next week. And then it's all of a sudden now Houston's beat you twice. Cause 
in case you don't already know this, there is a scrappy athletic Texas State team coming in who is very confident. Very confident. They just embarrassed Baylor. G.J. Kinney has flipped that roster over. He's brought in some go daddies. He's got T.J. Finley at quarterback, the former Auburn player, and they looked the part. And if you're not careful as UTSA, that is a team that will come in if you're still thinking about last week in Houston and they're going to get a victory. So you cannot let Houston beat you twice. You've got to just let that go flush it, get past it, and look ahead to week two and reset your season and get things moving back in the right direction. And an interesting storyline here that some of you may or may not know is that G.J. Kinney, the head coach of Texas State, and Jeff Trailer, the head coach of UTSA, have an actual uh, connection beyond coaching. Uh, G.J. Kinney, for those of you that don't know, he was a stud high school quarterback in the state of Texas, played at Canton High School in the early 2000s, actually played for his father. His father, some of you may remember, was, a, was, a, was the head coach out in East Texas that got shot by a parent. Almost took his, it almost took his life, but he was able to survive it. I don't have all the um, details surrounding that, but it was G.J. Kinney's dad, who was his coach at Canton High School. He ended up getting a job offer, uh, Kenny's dad did, to go coach, or, or, or it, was, it was a role at Baylor, which he accepted. And so going into G.J. Kenny's uh, senior year, his dad accepted a job at Baylor, and so G.J. moved in with his mom and stepdad, who lived in Gilmer ISD, where G.J. would eventually play starting quarterback for the Gilmer Buckeyes, who were coached by none other than Jeff Trailer. And there were some issues there with the UIL almost not approving the transfer, and they had to take it before the board, and they had to vote on it anyway. Anyways, he was able to play. He won the starting job. Um, Gilmer went 10-0 and that season and then got upset in the first round of the playoffs uh, by a team that was actually led by LaMichael James, which some of you might remember went on to play at Oregon, and I think he spent some time in the NFL after having some really good years under Chip Kelly. All right, the last team I'm going to talk about, the Tulane Green Wave. They did exactly what they were supposed to do. They picked up right where they left off. The offense was cooking. The defense was cooking. The guys were playing fast. They were playing free. They were playing scrappy. And most importantly, this Tulane team looked confident. I mean, these dudes looked confident. And that is very important for a week one outing. Um, it just looks like they hadn't skipped a beat since last season, which was good to see, especially with Ole Miss coming to town, which Tulane already has a sold out crowd for, for a week two matchup with uh, the Ole Miss Rebels, Lane Kiffin and the Ole Miss Rebels. I was surprised. I said it last week on the Tuesday show that Tulane was only favored six and a half points, nothing against South Alabama, but my goodness, I felt like they were at least going to win by double digits and they did. They won, what was it 37 to 17 and um, man, they, they did. They looked good. Uh, the only, I think noteworthy thing from this game that I'm curious, curious what comes down to was Michael Pratt was limping a little bit um, at the end of the game. I mean, we're talking about a dude that went 14 of 15 for almost 300 yards and four touchdowns. I mean, can you have a better game as a starting quarterback? But he was limping a little bit there at the end of the game. And uh, being that he is also a dual threat guy, I don't know if it was his ankle or what. Hopefully it was something very minor. Hopefully he's already bounced back from it and he is 100% full go for Ole Miss because that game is going to be exciting. All right, I am at 28 minutes. So this is what I'm going to do. The realignment stuff I was going to touch on, I'll touch on tomorrow. And the mailbag question, I will touch on tomorrow. Tomorrow will also be most likely Tuesday, like we did last week. But uh, just to give you a quick nugget, Pete Thamel had a report that um, uh, the American Conference is looking at Navy as their next expansion. I'm, I'm so sorry. Looking at Army as their next expansion member, and it would be football only. Um which makes me wonder if they're also going to consider a basketball only addition, someone like maybe uh, VCU who also fits into the footprint uh, geographical footprint that they're looking to stay in. Uh, I'll be more on that tomorrow. And we're going to talk more about the philosophy, the expansion philosophy, which I know some people disagree with, but we're going to talk about that tomorrow. And then I'll get to the mailbag question that had to do with the big East, but 
That's it for today. There's your rundown. I would love it if you leave me some feedback on how you feel about your team after week one. Remember, it's just week one. Whether it was good or bad, it's just week one. Let me know your thoughts about your team right there in the comments. If you're listening on one of the streaming platforms, send me a message as well. Leave that five-star review. And until next time, it's Trey Smith, College Game Time.